Thanks, Fred. Right, thanks, Pedro, for the introduction. So I will give you an overview of these exciting proposals of uh, witnessing quantum gravity effects in the laboratory. And um, these are experimental proposals that might be implemented in the maybe in the next 10 years, if you're lucky. And surprisingly, they they stem not from research in, uh, in high energy physics, but in research in, um, in quantum control of matter, so using uh, optical traps and levitating smaller systems at low energies. So I am I study themes on quantum quantum gravity uh, connected to quantum foundations and quantum information. So I'm a theoretician, but I will give you an overview of the experimental aspects as well from the way I understand it. So just to start, as you as you're definitely aware by now, the quantum gravity has still not been completely solved, and there are two main competing theories which are loop quantum gravity and string theory that differ in their, in their starting point. Loop quantum gravity quantizes the gravitational field, quantizes the geometry right away, whereas uh, string theory has a classical background space-time and quantizes the action of a string-like object. And as you know, not only these theories have um, their competing theories, but also within their theories, there are many different versions. So in, the string, in, in string theory, there is the famous uh, landscape problem where depending on how the extra dimensions are are bundled together you get different particles particle spectra whereas in loop quantum gravity there is a um, there is a quantization um quantization ambiguity represented by the immediate barbary immediate parameter and we won't be able to choose between these two theories before doing experiments so at the moment we just have them here and we might judge like their completeness or their um their consistency and so on in the meantime, other theories have come up um, to respond to this incompleteness of the project. So, for example, there is causal cell theory, where the, um, the main object is, is um, the causal structure of space-time that is quantized, and similarly something like this in causal dynamic tri triangulations. But these are much less developed theories, but they are other proponents. Like, and in fact, there's a list is huge. And this is from Wikipedia. This is probably like um, a not exhaustive list and somehow also overlapping list. But the idea is that we have this big problem of theories, so many theories and so little experiment by this. By now, you, I'm sure you know this. But and the only way that we will be able to choose these theories and even help developing these theories is to make contact with experiment. Um, there have been experiments with quantum mechanics and gravity. So most notoriously, there is this uh, there is this experiment by Colella, Overhauser, and Werner, also known as the COW experiment, where, I mean, the, the abstract is so short because it was the landmark experiment that they need to write a big abstract. We have used a neutron interferometer to observe the quantum mechanical phase shift of neutrons caused by their interaction with the Earth's gravitational field. So here, they showed that, that uh, gravity can affect a quantum mechanical phase on a quantum system, and at least gravity and quantum mechanics somehow can coexist. And more recently, there have been experiments with optical clocks and atomic clocks where they can measure the time dilation due to Einstein's general relativity when the clock is lifted, right? But in both of these experiments, the theory that explains the observations has gravity as a completely classical field. So as I said, it shows somehow that there is a compatibility between gravity and quantum mechanics, but it doesn't show any quantum aspects of gravity. So for example, in the, um, in the COW experiment, you have a beam of neutrons that comes in and it hits an interferometer. So it's, a, sorry, a, a grating that diffracts the neutrons so that they go in a superposition of the different paths. And then they hit another diffraction grating and then a third one. And some, some, some neutrons will travel in a super, superposition from A to B to D, and some will go and also in a superposition from A to C to D. And in this case, they will interfere at D, and this will cause interference effects in the statistics observed at these two rods here. And this is a proper interferometer experiment. So the schematic way of looking at this is this. You have a beam coming in from here up here to the left. It hits a, something that diffracts it, and so it goes in a superposition of traveling in two different paths. And then it hits another place where the focus, where the beam can be refocused. And if the phase along these two paths is the same, then all the, the neutron will always come out straight. It will go straight to the right. 
Whereas if there is a phase between these two parts, there will be interference effects and it will start also coming out from the, from the left. So there will be like, there will be some statistics. And depending on, so if you can affect a phase, you can see a change in the statistics. And in this case, in the Colello browser experiment, the phase is just a difference in potential energy. So a difference in the energy in the gravitational field, because as this apparatus can be rotated, there will be a height difference between the two paths on average. And you can compute the phase using the Newtonian approach, using the Newtonian potential energy. So mg delta h, where h is the height, and it depends on the way the apparatus is rotated. And, and they noticed that as they rotated the apparatus, they were getting these oscillations. So this is really the phase. You got this e to the i phi something in there. So you get this sinusoidal behavior. That's showing that as the particle travels in a superposition of paths, it accumulates a different phase given by the, the, by the Newtonian potential energy. So again, it's neat, but the gravity here is completely classical. How would we go about trying to see some quantum aspect of gravity? Well, the electric magnetic field was like, quantum mechanics was born because we discovered the, um, the quantization of the electromagnetic field, right? One of the very first papers on quantum mechanics was the paper by Einstein, where he explained the photoelectric effect, effect by assuming that uh, there were, uh, were, were particles of energy, uh, quantum of energy in the gravitational field, the photons. And later also the, the description of the Compton scattering so when, uh, when a high energy beam of light, so I think X-rays, were ionizing some, some electron out of an atom, they could explain the power spectrum observed of the electrons by, by drawing a particle diagram uh, in special relativity. So really assuming that the, the photon was, like the electron was being hit by a particle, a massless particle, and getting the, um, getting the energy this way. Can we do something like this for gravity? Well, actually, there have been studies where it show that this is basically impossible. So apparently, there's this, this is quite a cool paper to read about this, where they show that if you wanted to detect Compton scattering from a graviton, even in the ideal case with no noise whatsoever, the detector would be, need to be as big as Jupiter. And then if you start putting in shielding, because your gravity is so weak, you need to shield this effect from other interactions, such as neutrinos. So now we are shielding everything to get to neutrinos if you wanted to get the, to the to the gravitons, you would have to shield from neutrinos. And if you put this, the, the apparatus would become so heavy that it would collapse in a black hole. We can try doing particle physics experiments. So seeing like quantum field theory, seeing quantum gravity effects by, by reaching the Planck mass. But as you know, this is so far from current technologies that we don't think it's gonna be achievable anytime soon. Probably in, in the cosmology course that you've done in this course, in this class, you have seen that also quantum cosmology, quantum gravity can have effects on quantum cosmology, so on cosmology and observations that we can do of the early universe. But you probably also heard that there is there are problems due to lack of data. Essentially, like if we want to look at deviations in the power spectrum of the CMB, the biggest deviations due to quantum gravity come at those multiples. That have, don't, that have a high variance because they just they're, you're, you're sampling less points on the, in the sky and there's nothing we can do about it. So the error bars we cannot shrink there, the experimental error bars. And maybe we might not be able to resolve the difference between different quantum gravity theories or even see that there are quantum gravitational effects. So maybe some, some time, some, somebody could get even kind of disillusioned and say, well, if the universe is hiding, quantum gravity so well. So it's, it's hidden from the beginning of the universe. It's impossible to reach it by doing particle experiments. Do I need to jump in a black hole to see something? I, I think Carlo talked about this yesterday, that the center, you can reach the center of the black hole. So the quantum gravity there will play a role. But again, it's quite a drastic thing to do to check that quantum gravity actually comes into play. One might think that it's kind of, can say, why do all this effort? when we don't even know if we need such a theory. But in fact, there is a question where quantum gravity will come into play, and we are reaching the point where we can actually test it. And this is the question of what happens if you have a mass in a superposition of positions, and this mass is next to another mass that is not yet in a superposition, and these two masses can interact gravitationally. So 
what happens, what is the gravitational field generated by a mass in a superposition? And because we've been pushing for bigger and bigger, uh, not we, but the experimentalists have been pushing for bigger and bigger superposition sizes and, and, and bigger objects in superpositions, even to test if quantum mechanics can be applied to arbitrary scales. We are starting to reach a scale where this experiment might be done soon enough in laboratories. And we will need, and here quantum mechanics will come, uh, sorry, quantum gravity will have to step in and, and give an answer. So what happens? If the field is classical, there's only a few things that can happen. For example, the field might wait for the, um, for the particle to collapse in one of the two positions, and then it will update and move the particle with it. And there are a few proposals like this. The most famous is the one by Roger Penrose that says exactly that as the gravitational field, as the superposition is big enough to be observable, it will be collapsed by the gravitational field. There's other, there's other proposals by Diosi and there's the Rimini-Weber models that cap, they allow to couple um, quantum mechanical systems to the gravitational field, to a classical gravitational field. And these are all modifications of quantum mechanics. Otherwise, you might say, well, maybe the gravitational field is sourced by the expectation value of the center of mass of the superposition. This theory is called the Schrodinger-Newton or semi-classical gravity. And um, in, funnily enough, the particle, the test particle will fall towards the middle of the superposition. And in fact, in the Schrodinger-Newton approximation, the superposition will also self-gravitate and it will also be attracted to itself. In fact, these theories are, there's even problems of non-linearities and, um, and there's problems with localities. So they're actually disputed even on theoretical grounds. But it's an approximation that is used, for example, when the fluctuations in the stress energy tensor are small, you can do this approximation. And in fact, this is how the Hawking radiation is derived, for example. This is another alter alternative. Otherwise, there's another alternative where the, um, where the field might just be, decide to be sourced at random by some elements of the superposition. And so like the particle would just go randomly towards one of the two places. And this won't spoil the superposition because the randomness doesn't allow to tell you so the particle might move, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that the, that the other particle is there. These are called post-quantum theories. And the, more, the one I'm more um, aware of is this by Jonathan Oppenheim that was present at the, I oh know I wasn't there yesterday. Anyway, so these are a few ideas. But if the field is quantum, then quantum mechanics will tell us that, sorry, if the field is quantum, then we expect the field itself to be in a superposition. And then the test mass will gravitate, it will, will interact with the superposition, and it will itself be in a superposition because part of it will go one way and part of it will go the other way, and you will get a superposition of the test mass. So this is a situation that would not happen if the gravitational field is classical. But how do you detect such a, such a superposition? Right? In general, if you just if you had this thing in a box and you open the box, then you know you would always find it either on either up or down, right? You would not see the superposition. So what you would need to do is to do some interference effects. Also, another problem here is that even if these masses start to become bigger so that the forces can be measured, the accelerations due to the force of gravity are so weak that in fact this test mass will not delocalize as a result of the interaction. It will just it will feel different energies, but it won't necessarily actually move in, in distinguishable states. So these are complications like this. But there is one more aspect of this. So quantum mechanics is not just about superpositions, but we also have the fact that the two masses are entangled. And it's precisely the, the presence, presence of entanglement of quantum correlations that is the key to these new proposals to test quantum gravity, to witness quantum gravitational effects. So I will go over in the rest of the talk, I will go over some of the proposals. I will go mostly in detail in one of one of the proposals. And then I'll just show you a couple of slides on the other ones. And the first part will just be an idea of the, the description of the experiment. And then I will give another part where it's um, where I describe some technicalities. I'm not an experimentalist, so I will not go totally in detail, but I will just give you an idea of the kind of things that need to be considered in these experiments. So um, in 2017, two articles came out on the same edition of a physical review letter, both proposing this experiment, which is the, um, the creation of entanglement in the spin state 
of two masses. So these two masses are actually put next to each other in a superposition, and they're allowed to interact gravitationally, and this allows them to get entangled. And the main idea behind this, these experiments is that a classical field cannot, cannot create entanglement between two masses that are not entangled to start with. And so if you witness this creation of entanglement, then you can conclude that gravity was not mediated by a classical system. I put some asterisks here because in the second half of the lecture, I will, I will, show, I will go into detail of the theoretical aspect of this result. So there are some technicalities to consider, but you know, this is kind of the idea of the experiment. So I will go into the main proposal by Sugato Bause and collaborators because it's closer to an experimental realization. It's a more feasible realization. Uh, but the idea is the same as the one, the other one, the other paper here by Marletto and Bedral. So here you have a space-time diagram. And I put time going down because we will read the page from top to bottom. But you know, so we we start the experiment here at the top. I hope you can see my cursor. I've been using it a lot during the presentation. And so here at the beginning, you have two masses. So here you have two interferometers. This is interferometer one and this is interferometer two. And you have two masses with a, with a spin embedded in them. And uh, the spin is prepared in, uh, in uh, up plus down state. So in a superposition of, uh, of Z uh, direction eigenstates. And, and this is just the start of the experiment. Then some, some magnetic fields are applied to the particle so that they get delocalized and they get in a superposition of position dependent on their spin. So this is just like a stern like apparatus. So if you look at the, at the interferometer on the left, you have the spin up part of the wave function that will go to the left and the spin down, spin down part of the wave function that go to the right. And similarly for the, um, for the interferometer on the right, here it's the other way around because the formulas are a bit neater. So if, uh, if the, the spin down goes to the left and the spin up goes to the right. So at this stage here, we have two particles next to each other and they are in a superposition of positions each. And then they're just allowed to free fall. So they're just free falling in space. No other force is applied on them, or at least this is the, the theoretical ambition. And they're just interacting via gravity during this time. As you can imagine, these are four different branches and there will be different potential energies corresponding to these four different configurations. So this thing is free falling. And then at a certain point, the, the inverse process is, up, is applied. So the wave packet is, being, is brought back to its own position. So the, the spin up of, the, of one party goes back to the center and the spin down goes back to the center. So at this point, both particles, the superposition is undone. And then some measurements are done on the spins. And the point of this is that this evolution will entangle the spins. So even the spins start off being unentangled and they finish the evolution entangled. So now we will go to the calculation of this quickly. So here I wrote, I wrote down the state of the system before here, the preparation stage, before the superposition is done. So if you look at top left here, I wrote down the order of the Hilbert spaces. So you have the two spins, then you have the two center of mass of particle, the center of mass of particle A and the center of mass of particle B, and then also a Hilbert space for the geometry. This could be the geometry if you're if you can do the calculation in non perturbatively, or you can use the like the linearized quantum gravity approximation. So the spin two field. Um, so the preparation stage, you just have the superposition of the spins. This is a factor state. I just wrote it down like this because then because things will distribute. And then here you have the two center of masses. So C stands for center. So they are the center of the interferometer of the corresponding interferometer. And G sub CC corresponds to the, the state that is closest. So it's the quantum state that is peaked around the classical configuration of, of, the, uh, of the, the corresponding to the masses in these two locations. Then I saw that there is a question in the chat. So the Hilbert space of center of mass referred to, so the center of mass would be just uh, so if you have uh, 1D quantum mechanics, so we have we have this particle and we assume that maybe it moves only on one line, right? And you have the wave function for where it is. 
So that's the center of mass. Obviously, it's a compound system. It would be like a bigger system, but you can model still the degree of freedom of the center of mass as its own quantum mechanical degree of freedom. And its state is the whole, it's like this, this the Hilbert space would be L2R, right? Um, for the sake of calculation, you can assume that it's kind of like a qubit. It, it just it has the distinct things because you can control it so well. It doesn't spread much during the time of the evolution because these things are massive. So they don't have a big Compton wavelength. They stay quite put. So you just move them around. I hope this answered the question. So you have, good. You have one for the for one particle and one for the other particle. So after the preparation, you get you do the superposition. So this is when, so this is when the things they each go through their own stern like apparatus. So if you look at the first the first branch here, you have spin up, spin up, and then so that means the part the first particle went to the left and the second particle went to the right. Okay, and. If we assume this is being done quite slowly and the things are closer, we can we can we can assume that by the time the superposition is done, then the gravitational field has settled to another static field, the one that corresponds to the masses having moved to these new positions. And then similarly for all the other spin components. So for example, the last one here, spin down, spin down, the first particle moved to the right, the second particle moved to the left, and so you have this right, left corresponding to some positions on the, in the inside, their, um, inside their interferometers and the corresponding gravitational field. Then what happens during free fall? So during free fall, the, gravi the gravitational acceleration is not strong enough to actually move the particles around. You can actually compute this doing like some Newtonian approximation. And you see that there is really basically no acceleration is, is ridiculously small. For the, for the times of this experiment. But since there is a difference in potential energy, we can take an approximation in which the, we have basically position eigenstates, and these are also energy eigenstates, and basically they're they are accumulating a phase as they're free falling. And the phase is given by the Schrodinger equation. It's uh, e, times, e times time divided by h bar, where E is the gravitational potential energy, which in this case can be approximated by the Newtonian potential. It's like this. So by the time the free fall is done, each different branch will have accumulated a different phase. And these phases are given by this, by this, um, by these formulas calculated using the Newtonian potential. So for example, the spin for right left, so the sorry, the phase for right left here, the last element of the superposition, is just g m squared divided by d, which is the distance of closest approach times t over h bar and similarly for the other for the other um, three phases then after the superposition is after after the free fall is done the, there is a recombination so the superposition is undone and the and the center of mass is moved back to the center of the um, of the interferometer and so what you get here is that for each branch the position against state becomes cc again and the gravitational field also goes back to the configuration corresponding to CC. And basically, the center of mass and the geometry factorize out of the state. You can write it like this. But what's left is that these spins now are in this state, which generically is an entangled state. Is an entangled state. So if you go on and do measurement on these spins to see that the, the, you will see that there are correlations. And the correlations are given by different aspects of the gravitational field. So if we want to calculate what kind of numbers, just to put in some numbers in here to see what kind of um, what is needed to see this effect. For example, let's say that for the sake of an approximation simplification, we take that delta x, which is the size of the superposition, so how delocalized the particle is, is much bigger than d, so the distance of closest approach. And if you look at this formula, this, this means that you can ignore you can ignore all the phases compared to right left to the one from spin spin down, spin down. So you can write down the state like this. And this state is maximally entangled when phi is pi, right? So some multiple of pi. But let's say that it's quite entangled if pi is of order one, the phi is of order one. What we want is to see, to have, to have non, like if you have minuscule phases, you won't see anything. So technically it will be entangled, but it will be hard to detect it. So let's say some order one phase. What do you need? So let's look at this formula. You see that 
the bigger the mass, the bigger the phase, the longer the superposition, the bigger the phase, and the closer the masses can be, the bigger the phase. So these are the ways you can grow the you can grow this phase. But there are limitations. So for if in principle, if you could do the experiment infinitely long, you could for whatever num for whatever value of m and d, you could just run the keep the superposition long enough, and this thing will eventually become a border one. But there are limitations. For example, superpositions tend to decohere, and there inevit there's inevitable sources of decoherence. And in practice, this sets a limit to the to the duration of this experiment, at least for what is feasible at the moment. And we will go over sources of decoherence later. Similarly, we can't bring the particles too close to each other because if they get too close, then you start having uh, vacuum fluctuation effects, like the like the Casimir effect. And this will be a direct interaction between the particles, and this can also cause entanglement. And obviously, if we want to demonstrate that entanglement is done by gravity, then we want to rule out this explanation for entanglement. And so you have to keep the particles far enough so they don't start interacting at the level of electromagnetism. And so this puts a lower bound on, on the superposition, oh, sorry, on how close you can get these particles to each other. If you plug these numbers in, you see you get the mass that you need to do this experiment, which is 10 to the minus 14 kilograms which is small for normal standards, but is huge for particle mechanics, uh, for quantum mechanics, because this is 10 to the 12 mass of the neutrons, of the neutron. So this is a big, big, big object for a quantum mechanical standard. It's a, it's a proper solid state object. But um, this number is slowly being reached, and it's been reached independently of gravitational experiments necessarily, because people want to test how far can one can bring quantum mechanics. Also, as a side note, this is 10 to the minus 6 Planck mass. So it's still quite far from the experiment, from, from the energy scales that you would expect from just uh, like a random um, dimensional analysis. And I guess the reason why this is the case is because the experiment is done really slowly. And so this kind of counteracts the um, the effect huh? so, so it kind of allows you to have some some room and um and yeah so obviously the bigger the mass the easier the experiment in a way the shorter it needs to be for example but also it's harder to keep bigger things in superpositions so you get you get masses entangled by gravity then what so there are these two results these are no theorems that say that if two systems A and B are interacting via a third system G and they get entangled because of the interaction with G, then G cannot be a classical system. And uh, where classical is defined as uh, the presence of, there are no interference effects or there are no non-commuting variables. And um, the reason that we say non-classical is because there are alternative theories to quantum mechanics. So things can be neither classical nor quantum. They can, they, there's, there's a third, fourth, different versions, different possibilities for theories. And especially because we are moving into unknown realms, we might want to keep our, our minds open at this level, our possibilities open, at least from a theory perspective or like information theory perspective. But so if we, if we detect this gravitationally mediated ent entanglement, then we can conclude one of these three things. Either the gravitational field is not classical, or the gravitational field somehow transmits information faster than light, or gravity is not mediated by field. For example, it's the result of some direct interparticle interaction, some non-local term like this. These are the three alternatives. And we will go in, in the second part of the lecture, we will go into the derivation of this no-go theorem by Galli, Giacomini, and Selby. But this being said, we computed this, the creation of entanglement using a Newtonian interaction. So we really put uh, like a, a term in the Hamiltonian that is like this, that, that couples directly the two masses, and there is no field. We didn't use a field to model the interaction. And so we got this, um, we got this result. But we know that this is an approximation, right? So. GR, our best theory of gravity, tells us that gravity is mediated locally by a field, right, the metric, the metric tensor. And it tells us also that 
in this situation where the masses are moving slowly and the, um, and the distance between the two masses is much smaller than C times the characteristic, so the characteristic time scale of the experiment. In this approximation, we can take this quasi-static approximation and model it using Newtonian gravity. But we know that in fact, under the hood, what's going on is that there is the curvature of space-time. And in fact, recently we also showed, we demonstrated that, that gravity is a local field. Because if you think about it, all the famous effects of GR, like, um, like the deviation of light or the, um, or the time, time dilation uh, in different levels of the energy field, and even I think even the, um, the expansion of the universe, don't, uh, they don't rely on the fact that the gravitational field has um, causal perturbations traveling. So it can all be modeled by instantaneous it's all, it's all static configurations, right? So in the in the deviation of light, gravity is not changing. There is no propagation of uh, of, um, of perturbations. But finally, just a few years ago, we saw evidence that the gravitational field actually updates causally. That the gravitational waves arrive together with the light and not before. So really, if we believe our theories, we our best theories, then we know that gravity is mediated by a local field. And we also trust quantum mechanics to be successful. And we don't really necessarily think of a third alternative. Then we can say that if we see the gravity mediated entanglement in the lab, then we can conclude that in that lab, we created a superposition of space times. Okay, so I have a question here. This is thanks for asking the question. I, I tried to say it, but maybe I wasn't clear. So I've been asked, where do we use the quantumness of gravity in the derivation of entanglement of the two spin? If GMEN cannot be detected, what could be wrong in the derivation? Okay, these are two different questions. I'll take them now because it's a good time to talk about it. So you're you're right. We did not use the quantumness of gravity here. We used this term. In the you know, we just said there is this energy between the two the, the between the four branches we, cal we compute this energy using the Newtonian field which is a direct interparticle um, interaction and in fact this is this option is covered by the theorem so the theorem says that if GAM is detected then either the field is not classical so it's something like quantum or is a non-causal classical field or or it's not even directed by field, it's directed by interparticle, uh, sorry, it's, it, it's a direct interparticle interaction. And so, yes, we did not use the quantumness, we used an approximation, okay? But we have a we understand, like it's, we know it's an approximation. Some people don't accept this full percent. There are, there are some, uh, there, is, there are still some debate in the literature, but I, I believe at least personally, I think people, are, people have made this argument that since we know what we know that this, approx this is an approximation, we know what the underlying mechanism for the transmission of gravity is. So it's 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 a local field, and we expect it if we if we expect it to be a quantum local field rather than uh, not even a field and classical somehow. Um, by the way, I should also have said that there is a derivation of this of these phases using quantum field theory. Um, in this in this paper here, so if you want, you can also go see it. It's also a prediction of quantum field theory. If so, the, the other important question that was asked is that what happens if we don't detect it? So um, there could be many there could be many different um, explanations. Obviously, one is that gravity is not class gravity is not quantum, right? It's uh, it is really like this spontaneous collapse, for example that this experiment, like you cannot scale the superpositions and one of the other theories are true. It could be that there are some decoherence effects that we not, did not take in account. For example, recently there was a paper that came out about uh, the decoherence that could be brought by the just the thermal graviton noise, which I think it was the first time this was computed and is still being peer reviewed. So maybe it's something like that. There are some mechanisms that we don't take in account. There were some people that were talking about like Planck and black holes. So I'm sure there could be many of explanations. So at the moment, I I'm just focusing on the possibility that this will be detected. If it's not detected, obviously, it will open also a whole new side of the debate. So I hope this answered your question. 
I will quickly go over like a similar proposal. This is a refinement uh, by Krisnanda and, and Pater Nostro, Tam and Paterek. And here the idea is instead of having a, a superposition using a stern airlock, what happens is that the two masses are held in a magnetic trap. So in this um, in these quantum information labs, they do this amazing thing where they can suspend suspend particle inside light beams or using um, some magnetic fields. And the particles are basically sitting in a potential and they behave like uh, simple harmonic oscillators. And this can be changed in real time. They do some amazing things that I don't really understand. But in this case, you, have, you can imagine two simple harmonic oscillators sitting next to each other. And th this is their, their Hamiltonian, right? So you have particle A and particle B, and these are simple harmonic oscillator, uh, sorry, <coughs> Hamiltonians with the characteristic frequency. And then you also have a gravitational term. So you add this gravitational term in your considerations. L is the distance between the, um, the two, the centers of these two traps. Then if you assume also, so XA and XB is the deviation from the center of the traps. And if you assume this is small, you can expand the gravitation of, you can expand this Hamiltonian and you expand it quadratically. So the first term is just a shift in the energy. It doesn't, it doesn't, play any role. The second term is actually two terms. There are two linear terms that actually don't cause any entanglement. They each add to the free, if you want, to their single particle of Newtonian. But then the third term, the first nonlinear term in the expansion, actually couples the two masses together. And this is an energy, of course. So if this energy is comparable to the energy in the trap, so we're assuming like that they are close to the ground state, then this, if you let these particles interact long enough, you expect there to, to be some entanglement. And uh, you can also expand this better by assuming again the ground state. So you expand the expectation value of the difference, the, quadrat the square of the difference into the sum of the expectations of the squares. And you get this H bar over M omega, which is what you expect from quantum mechanics. And you can compare this, you can compare this to the, you can compare this to this, and you get this new number that if it's close to one, again, you expect entanglement to be there. And you see this is a bit different because before we had m squared and you have one over the distance and you and here you also have the frequency. So it kind of gives you, it's an alternative. It gives you a different uh, parameter space to explore. I see I have another question. Sorry, it seems to me even gravity is classical. The phase is still non-zero. So if G M E is not cannot be observed, gravity. I sorry, I don't understand the second question. Maybe we maybe we move back. We move the questions to the to the end. And I'll keep going at the moment. But do ask me this question again at the end. Okay. Then there is a. There's a third thing that relies on a different principle. So some of you might have studied this in quantum information. The, the Wigner function is another way to represent the state of a, of a quantum system. And for semi-classical states, this Wigner function is always positive. But for example, big superpositions of classical states can be negative. And this thing is called, when, when the Wigner function is negative, it's called non-Gaussianity. And non-Gaussianity is an information resource. So it's used in quantum information uh, you need it to do arbitrary quantum computations. And there is a, there is a similar theorem where non-Gaussianity cannot be created by interacting with the classical field. And uh, in this paper, Richard Dowell and collaborators proved that, um, that if you have two Bose-Einstein, so if you have one Bose-Einstein sitting on its own in a trap, and if you wait long enough for the gravitational interaction to take place, then this will develop non-Gaussianity. And um, and this would be, so if you were to, to detect non-Gaussianity creation in a single Bose-Einstein condensate, that would also be evidence for, um, for quantum gravity. And um, this has been explored less to my knowledge. There's many, less, many more results on the other, both in theory and in experiment, than there are on this non-Gaussianity experiment. So if this thing kind of interests you, it's a good place to start, I think. So now I move on to some more practical aspects of these experiments. Again, 
Um, this will be more like an overview, just to give you the flavor of the things that are kept in, in consideration for this kind of experiments, more than give you like a full theory of, of, um, of the practical considerations. So first, in the first, just before I, I said, let's pretend that delta x is much bigger than d. Um, this will simplify the formulas. Obviously, if d is a, a fraction of a, of a millimeter, so 200 micrometers, then delta x to be much bigger than d would be like a superposition that's a huge superposition. So in fact, what happens is that the delta x is smaller than d, even the diagram is uh, misleading. So you want to take this into consideration. So you want to keep all the phases in here. What you can do is you factorize the left left and right right phases because they are um, because they are the same. So you factorize them out, you write it like this. And you can also refactorize the states like this. And this again is an entangled state. So to measure the entanglement, sorry, so these are the phases. So this again is, a, is an entangled state. So to measure the entanglement, basically here you have the, the first particle you have spin up, spin down. So this is entangled if the part, the states on the right side are perpendicular. So the more, the less overlap, the more entangled. And you can compare this to the state before. And the entanglement is the same as if you had this state. So the amount of entanglement is the same as if you had this state where phi effective is given by the sum of the two phases and is given like this. So you see that the formula is a bit more complicated. Obviously, if delta x is uh, 0, then uh, the phase is 0. Well, there is no superposition, so there is no entanglement. Um, this actually is linearly zero in delta x. So if you expand this, uh, they expand uh, in delta x over d. So what you want, you want a delta x that's a bit bigger, obviously. So that's one of the things to take into account. And the bigger delta x, the easier it is to get uh, the coherence, as you will see in a moment. Another thing is, you have entanglement, and we know how to define entanglement, right? So two particles are entangled if their state cannot be written as a product. Right? But if I hand you a quantum system, how do you know if it is entangled or not? Right? You have to hopefully do some measurements. You know that you can't, if I hand you a quantum system randomly, you do, you do not know a state. You have to do some experiments. But as you do experiments, you also destroy the state. So there needs some conf configurations. The practical way to do it is to design an entanglement witness, which is an observable that is such that the expectation value is uh, always positive for every separable quantum state, but it's negative for at least one entangled state. Okay, so you, what happens is that if you go on and measure this observable and you, you get an average that is negative, then you can, you can convince yourself that the, that the state is entangled and you, you witnessed entanglement. This is how it's said in the literature. And obviously, you basically what you do is that you have some idea of what the state will be, and then you design the witness specifically specifically for this state. And then when you build your experiment, you you create this quantum state, right? You make these particles fall, and at the bottom you measure this uh, this w. And then you measure it to a certain you measure it to enough precision where you can you can certify that you are negative. Okay, this is just a, an idea. This is a field of entanglement witness. So now let's talk about the coherence. Um, you probably know this, but if you don't, I will go over it because I think it's one of the neatest results in quantum information. So if, if, you, have, if you have a system that is in a superposition and it interacts with a system that you don't observe that we call the environment, if the environment is in affected enough by this interaction, then it, to you that you can't observe the environment, it will look to you like the particle has collapsed. So the wave function of the particle has collapsed in the sense that you cannot do any interference experiments with it. So let's say that you have this system, you have your system here in a superposition of two states, and uh, you have the environment in, in a certain quantum state that you don't know and you cannot observe. And they interact, and as the result of interaction, you get some degree of entanglement between your system and the, and the environment. Then you can write down the, the, the density matrix of this state. But since you don't observe the environment, what you do is you trace out 
the environment to obtain the the partial state of your system and this is the system this is the state which we, with which you will interact after the evolution and you see that the off diagonal terms so the ones that are zero one and one zero they have a prefactor here oh, sorry and the prefactor is the overlap between the two the two systems of the two, the two states of the environment and you see that as this overlap becomes smaller and smaller your off diagonal terms become smaller and smaller and you're left with a mixed state and maybe even the totally mixed state so you lose the ability of doing an interference experiments so it's the result is as if the environment interaction with the environment collapsed the wave function of your system so it's really important to keep the environment away or at least keep the coherence at bay and fortunately the coherence especially in the position basis has been studied very well both theoretically and experimentally and the way this is modeled is using a master equation. So you have the here you have the time evolution of the matrix matrix elements. So here you have uh, x and x prime at two different locations. So these are the off diagonal terms. Well, I guess it's true even if x and x prime are the same. And um, and this is the time evolution of them. So dot represent the d by the d. And here the first term is nothing but the Schrodinger equation. But in the presence of the environment, you would add this other term here, which is just some function of the difference between these two positions times the matrix element itself. And so gamma, this gamma controls the, the decay of the of diagonal terms. Indeed, if for, for a simplification, you assume that the state is um, would be static, right? So if the, if the Schrodinger equation on its own would give you no time evolution, then the solution to this formula up here where h that uh, that rho commutes with h is zero then you get um exponential decay on the orthogonal terms and it's controlled by this gamma x minus x prime so this is how you measure this is how you model the coherence and uh, in particular if uh, the decoherence is due to to like a thermal bath of some sort of systems we will consider air and um, and thermal photons then you can write you can write that gamma down like this, where you have uh, you have some prefactor here, small gamma, and you have the wavelength of the system that you're considering. <coughs> and essentially, there are two regimes here, depending on how on the superposition size compared to the to the wavelength of the probing probing system. If the wavelength is very big compared to the um, to the superposition size, then here you can expand. The, you can tell or expand this and you get some quadratic dependence on the on the separation distance so you see here it's like a parabola down at the bottom uh, and so bigger the larger the superpositions decay faster because you start approaching a place where you can resolve the um, the separation whereas if the probing wavelength is much smaller than the separation size then this you get some you get um you get this this gamma saturates and you get like a constant and this is because at this at this in this framework you can imagine really that the probing systems are balls compared to your to your superposition so one collision it's enough to tell where the particle is this is similar in optics where you just want the wavelength to be small enough to 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 resolve your your stars and stuff like this so thermal photons so the two main sources of the coherence, so two that we will consider are thermal photons. So if you have if you have your apparatus sitting in some protecting shielding environment or something, the, shield, the, the environment will have some temperature, and so it will have probabilities of emitting photons. Even your even the masses that are doing in that are flying in this position will have some temperature because they're they're solid state systems, and so there's always probabilities of emitting some photons, and so you will get the coherence from there. Um, at radio 5 Kelvin, this is in the long wavelength regime. So the, the wavelength of these thermal photons is quite big. And so you have this long wavelength regime. Whereas for air molecules, this would be like, you know, when you create the vacuum, some molecules would be left behind. And these will have uh, their thermal wavelength is actually much smaller than the superposition size. And so you're in this short wave, like, wavelength regime. And just to give you an idea of what these formulas look like, so uh, you have 
So here is for the black body, just for the scattering. There's also like absorption and emission of photons. But just from scattering from photons, you get this enormous sensitivity to the temperature. And this R is the size, so it's the radius of the particle in a superposition. And here you have the, the localization. And all the numbers are in SI units. And you see here that there is an enormous sensitivity and it's quite fast for like, if this were all one, 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 this would decay incredibly fast. Obviously that tax will be small, the temperature will be order one and, uh, and the radius will also be small. But you see that you really have to make things small otherwise this 10 to the 36 really hits you. And for air as well, similarly, here you have the pressure of the gas and the inverse of the, of the temperature. So there's also like, there's also like um, interplay, like you, here you would want to make the temperature small to make the wavelength very big. But here on the right, if you make the temperature small, that means that, uh, um, what was it? Uh, to, uh, if at constant pressure with, with smaller temperature, it means that you have more air molecules. So you'd have more probability of hitting. So the many things that go into calculating these formulas. I have references at the end of the, of the talk. And if you put these things together, you see that the experiment could be done with something around uh, 4 Kelvin and uh, a pressure of 10 to the minus 17 millibars. And these have been, both been done already, together even. The problem is to do it in a place where, where you can also do the rest of the experiment, not just create the super vacuum. Uh, and so this is the kind of advance to do. And just for reference, uh, for curiosity, this pressure is the pressure in interstellar space. So between two stars, this is the kind of pressure you would have. So even you couldn't go to this, it's a better vacuum than the one you would get orbiting around the Earth, for example. Then I, we talked about this uh, close, this proximity interaction with the particles. So as I said, gravity could create entanglement, but if you want to demonstrate that it was gravity to create it, then you also have to be convincing and showing that there was no other thing at play. And there is this force between, these are big solid, you can imagine they're big objects in a way. And uh, the electric objects will feel a force due to their, when they're close to each other. If you know, like, uh, like geckos, they walk on walls using uh, proximity forces like this, even if they're neutral, they are neutral particles. And uh, you certainly have heard of the, of the Casimir effect, where two non-conducting plates, when they're brought close to each other enough, they will start feeling attractive force. And this Casimir polder effect is the same thing, just for spheres. And the formula is something like this. So it's a quantum field theory effect. So you have this H bar and T. R, the big R is the radius of the mass. So the bigger the radius, the more it looks like a sphere, the more, the more there is like a, there is like more wavelengths are cut out. And you see, that's the crucial part. It's the distance to the seventh. And so even if this, the prefactor here were extremely weak, at one point it will dominate on the gravitational interaction, right? Because of this R to the seven. So this will, no matter what you make the materials of or whatever, at one point, this will give you, um, like a, it will give you a, a minimum distance at which you can put your masses. There is, a, there is a proposal to put like a screen between the two particles. So like, a, it's like, it's like a, each particle will feel the effect from the screen, but the screen will act like a Faraday cage. So they will both feel from the screen, but they won't feel each other's attraction. And so they cannot get entangled with it. But this leads to complications because then the particles will be attracted to the plate. And so all these things have been studied, like are being studied as we talk. Then also to achieve this kind of superpositions, this is kind of what one of the proposals is. It's like you have, <coughs> you keep the particles suspended here for a bit to create the, the, the spin you want. And then you just, you pull the thing out of the trap and you're allowed to fold it down this <coughs> cavity. <coughs> Sorry, this cavity between the two magnets. So here it gains velocity. So that then when it goes here, it will experience this very fast uh, in homogeneities in the magnetic field that will make it move and go into a superposition. And there's, there's plenty of technicalities here. Like I, I, I won't go into it, but you have to consider the fact that uh, um, the particles will get trapped in some places. So actually what they do is that the regular interval, they flip the spins so that the particles switch positions, that the wave packets switch positions and so on. Uh, this is how you can read more about it here. And also 
This is also quite re very recent, as you see, 28th of May, 2021. It was the first time that a full stern girl like apparatus was built, apparently, from the start to the end. So there's a superposition and then doing of a superposition. And the numbers are actually quite interesting. So here, the superposition size is quite big. Obviously, these are single particle interferometers. They're not two. But the superposition size is quite, is quite good already. The time is, very, is quite short. But some is starting to get there. <coughs> Sorry. And the mass is also there are many orders of magnitude away still. But it's something. So in summary, these kind of experiments will be the first direct evidence of a non-classical nature of gravity, so that there's something going on beyond, beyond classical gravity. These experiments are being done thanks to advances in quantum technology. The, the claims behind these experiments, the ones that give strength to these experiments, are based on quantum information theoretic arguments. And even if there are caveats coming from these arguments, we will go over them also in the next part of the lecture. Are, if we trust our best theories, general relativity and quantum mechanics, then we might say that this is the first direct evidence that space-time is a quantum entity. So I will, if the chair is good, I will stop here for a moment to get the questions uh, for like five minutes. Yeah, no problem. So are there any questions for Andrea? I think you have one in chat if you want to try to answer that uh, from before. Or if you want, you can postpone it a little to the end. No, this is, I think this is a good time maybe to answer the question. So, so this last question here is, if GME is not observed, the gravity cannot be classical. Yeah, if GME is not observed, gravity can be classical. So for example, you can have this, um, this post-quantum theories where, um, let me see. No, I won't scroll all the way down because it would take forever to go back. But the post-quantum theories say that uh, gravity is a classical field. I think it's even the general relativistic field, but it's sourced, it's sourced stochastically from the, um, from the quantum superposition. So you have this uh, superposed system and then gravity needs a source and it will sample randomly like some part of it <coughs> and then evolve evolve uh, as if there was a classical source there. And so this is a way that you can have a classical field without collapse of the wave function. Uh, I haven't studied this in detail, but uh, I've heard, uh, I've been at some um, seminars on this. This is the, my, take, my take, uh, take away from that. I think this also answers your your intermediate question. Is there any other, any other question? Ah. Okay, so I think uh, I would be, I think there is no more questions. So maybe I can move on to the theory part unless there is preference to take a break. I, I don't know, I think uh, as you wish. Okay, I'll, I'll go on because it's already past, um, past half. So we'll do it. And uh, in case if there's more questions, we can go after, or otherwise we finish earlier. So we've gone. So here, now we are totally switching gears and we are gonna go, so this was the kind of quantum gravity aspect in a way. But now we're moving into the quantum foundations aspect, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, we're going to go in detail in what in what goes into proving this uh, Nogo theorem. I don't think I will be like hundred um, percent rigorous in the proof, but you will get basically all the ingredients you need to understand the proof, and then you can go and read it. The, the paper is very clear. Um, so let's read this. Uh, let's read the let's read the theorem. So it says. We consider two non-classical systems, A and B, that are initially in a separable state, and a third unknown system, G. 
Then the theorem says, if entanglement between the systems A and B is observed, then the following statements are incompatible. There is no signaling between A and B. A and B interact locally via the mediator G. And three, G is a classical system. So here there's plenty of words that are kind of undefined. So there is this non-classical, separable state, um, entanglement is observed, or no signaling between A and B, interacting locally with the mediator G, right, and classical system. These are all things that need to be defined to understand the theorem. But this is the beauty of no-go theorems. So what's often no-go theorems, what they do, they consider like a larger class of theories with, uh, that, are, that include many of the theories we know, like classical mechanics or Newton equation or local hidden variables or, or um, you know, say what. And they prove some result that is valid for all of this class of theories. And I think these are fascinating results and they're my, kind, of my favorite, kind of my favorite theoretical results. And a few other examples, very notoriously, there's Bell's first theorem that says that a local hidden variable theory cannot reproduce the statistics of entanglement. Or there's a Koch and Specker theorem saying that there is no joint probability distribution for the results of incompatible measurements, even on the same, on the same, uh, sub, on the same system. And most recently, this is from two years ago, the local friendliness inequalities. So this theorem says that if quantum theory is valid for all systems, can be applied for all systems, then either the consequences of free choice is propagate superluminally or facts are relative. So there is no absolute, there are some facts that are true for, for some bodies and it's not true for somebody else. And, um, and this is, um, they want to say about this, that what is fantastic about this is that they, these no-go theorems, they say, if you observe this or that, then, and then it says something quite interesting about the nature of reality, or, like, or at least the, um, the character of the physical theories that you can use to describe your observations. And I think this is a fantastic thing. And there's a, there's a lot of active research on this stuff. The first two theorems are quite old. The third one was published uh, like two years ago, but there's many other kind of results. I think these are the most kind of landmark. So to do this, what we do is that we'll introduce like a large class of theories that are called process theories. And then we will gradually make, it, make this class smaller so that we get to the place where we can prove this theorem. So by adding like the various assumption of the theorem. And we will we'll talk about the causal process theories and then generalized probabilistic theories. And then we will talk about uh, how in these theories you can characterize classicality and entanglement. And then finally, we will be able to prove the Nogo theorem. And um, the reason I decided to go for over this theorem and not the other one is because these, these kind of concepts are very widely used at the moment in, uh, in the quantum foundations and quantum information communities. And if you are interested in this overlap between quantum gravity and quantum mechanics, uh, quantum gravity and quantum information, then this is the kind of stuff you want to know. You would like to know maybe uh, to, to read this literature. So let's move in. So process theories are is a, is a big framework to understand and build theories that focuses on the way that uh, systems transform and how the transformations compose with each other. And uh, the roots from of this of this kind of uh, framework is comes from category theory. That is, it's uh, the studies maps between mathematical objects. And uh, but the moment they've been used in, in many different applications in very different fields, like in computing, in, in logic, in, in proof theories, in uh, natural language pr processing, and importantly for us, in quantum foundations and quantum information theory. What, the, what I really like about the process theory is that they come with, a, with an expressive graphi graphical calculus. So you can actually do calculations by drawing diagrams. You might remember, like, um, if you've studied, like, um, world, the world's general relativity use, you must have seen these diagrams, right? And it's a way like you can have tensor, some like the interaction between tensor spaces can be cast as a process theory. It's kind of this graphical calculus developed by Penrose, but there's many different examples. And they all, the reason that you can draw these pictures is because these are process theories. And in process theories, you have two main objects there, you have the systems and then that are depicted as wires. 
and the processes that are depicted as boxes with wires coming in and wires coming out. So they come in from the bottom and they come out from the top. And you have labels on the wires that, that are the, like labeling the different kinds of systems. And so, for example, some examples of process theories, you can have sets and functions. Sorry, so set theory is the, the systems are sets and the functions are the processes. In topology, you have topological spaces and continuous maps. So you can move, you can see like how maps uh, compose with each other. Um, then you have linear algebra and vector spaces and linear transformations. So these are all the tensor, these are the tensor calculus. And you can also cast pure quantum mechanics uh, with the unitary transformations and pure states. And you can cast operational quantum mechanics using all the all the um, density matrices and the trains, non-increasing transformations, which will explain, I will explain a bit later. And the idea here is that if you have two processes, you can compose them in two different ways. One way is if the wires match up, then you can compose them sequentially. So this is the circle like G after F, and you depict it by joining them up like this. So you see that the, the systems are really seen as the what allows processes to match up. So the processes take the center stage more than the systems. And then you have a second, you have a second way is to put them in parallel. So this is designed here with the with a tensor product symbol, because in quantum mechanics, for example, it will represent the tensor product. And you just draw them sitting side by side by side. What's cool is that a formula like this that represents how the tensor product and the com direct composition interact is an obvious tautology in the in the diagrammatic calculus. So here, for example, on the right, you see that you have F1, so you have G1 after F1 in parallel with G2 after F2. And this is the same as G1 in parallel with G2 after F1 in parallel with F2. And you see that in the diagram, this is obvious. Like you can slice the diagram like this way, horizontally or vertically, but you don't need to do it. So if you're doing computations where you are shuffling around a lot of symbols in this way of writing, a lot of this shuffling disappears if you use the graphical calculus. And for example, another thing is that, so you have this, you have processes, you link them up together and what you get is our, our new processes, right? So if you get these boxes together lined up like this, as long as the systems are compatible. And then two diagrams are the same, even if you can deform, like you can move around uh, some wires left and right. What matters only is the input systems and the output systems. Then what you do inside is a bit less, it's less important. You can shuffle things around. What matters is the connectivity of the diagrams. And in fact, two diagrams are the same if they act the same when plugged in other diagrams. So then we can have three different kinds, three main three distinguished processes. You have states where you start with no system and you move on into, you start, and then you have systems. And this kind of represents, if you want to think about, um, about modeling experiments, for example, this will represent the setup of an experiment. If you're modeling like the way you cook, some people do it, that this would be like bringing the ingredients home and then you put them on the table and now you have some, some, some ingredients on the table. Then you have effects where you go from having a system to no system anymore. And this normally represents the result of an observation. So you see something and then you stop the experiment. So this is an, this is an effect. This is what is kind of modeled by this. When you join effects and states together, sometimes you get systems you get the processes with no systems coming in and out, and these are called scalars. And in the process theories that we will, we will consider, they represent either amplitudes or probabilities and stuff like this. And in fact, there is, as you already must have realized, there's a close similarity between this and the bracket notation, sorry. <coughs> so states are cats and the facts are bras. And when you join bras and cats together, you get a number, you get a scalar that is the amplitude of the process. And but so you can do the same computations, but they're easier to read. So for example, here on the right, this formula, if you look at it at the beginning, you don't really know what's going on. And you can piece it together, but if you look at the right, it's much more obvious what's going on. So you have two systems, one undergoes a unitary evolution on its own, then there is a, an evolution of the two systems together. Then one of the two systems is projected on certain state, right? And what you write here is with the process, you put in a system A and B and you get out 
some so you put in a state for a and b and you get out a new state for a maybe with a not not modulus one amplitude but you know it's a new state not necessarily normalized but here you see on the left you really see the logic it's it's like exalted the logic of the process whereas on the right it contains all the same information but it's harder for our minds to parse it so these were the process theories this is a huge class of theories now we can start narrowing down to go to things that are more interesting for us so a causal process theory is where it's where it's a theory is a cause is a process theory where you only have one effect which is called the discard and i'll explain in a moment why and uh, maybe you have a process theory that is not causal but you can also have a sub theory of it it's like a, you restrict the number of states and transformations and you get a, a process theory and the discard follows a couple of rules so the fact that it's unique makes it follow a few a few rules for example here on the right you have the discard of two systems of a conjoint system and it's the same as the discard for each system uh, composed in parallel similarly if you are in a causal process theory if you discard a system after a transformation after a process what you're left here is with a new effect and since this is a, since every effect is unique this is equal to discarding the initial system and so that, this is why it's called discarding in a way if you like it's like it doesn't matter what you do to the system that you discard if something happens to it after since you're discarding it it's kind of like not looking at it anymore it doesn't really matter what's happening to it this also means that there is a unique scalar because if you have um if in a way the scalar is a is a is a is an effect over the system with no dimensions and so it also implies that there is a unique scalar in causal process theories an example that is very important for us of uh, causal process theory of causal process theories are the process theory of completely positive trace preserving maps and these maps are the maps that ma that uh, is the most general transformation from a density operator to a density operator in quantum mechanics and uh, normally any any completely positive trace preserving map phi can always be decomposed in this way where you have basically your system interacts with an ancilla system so you have an ancilla system they undergo some unitary evolution together and then some part of the final system is discarded and if you want diagrammatically it's written like this so again you see this is the transformation is an unitary interaction with some ancilla system that is then discarded so obviously all the unitary evolutions are CPTP maps, but you have many more evolutions like this. For example, what we were looking earlier in the coherence, where there are, where your system becomes more and more mixed slowly, that is a CPTP map. In fact, it's exactly that, right? It's interacting with an environment, and then the environment is ignored. You can have other things that are more like uh, things you might do in a lab, like discarding a system and preparing a new system and stuff like this. But all these together form a process theory where the states are density matrices so the yeah, linear operators on the Hilbert space that are positive and the trace one the discarding is literally taking a trace so when you take a trace of a system you get the trace which is one and in fact since these maps are trace preserving if you take the trace after applying the map you are left with the same as taking the trace before applying the map and this is exactly the trace preserving property so as i said that quantum mechanics is one kind of process theory but we are interested just in this property that discarding a system after a transformation is like discarding a system before transformation and there are many different theories that behave like this and what happens is that you can prove results based only on this the same way that you know you can you know you can model uh, you can model movements on a plane as a vector or you can move uh, you can model quantum states as vectors or solutions to to linear equations or, as vector spaces and if you prove results for vector spaces they are true in all vector spaces regardless of the particular application and the same thing happens here so if you prove results for a causal process theory it's true for all process theories or for all causal process theories be it quantum mechanics or something else so one result that we can prove that is quite interesting is that causal process theories are non-signaling. This means here, here we have a setup, for example, 
we're talking quantum information. So we have Alice and Bob. So we have Alice on the left and Bob on the right. And Alice and Bob receive, receive a, a, each they receive a system that could be entangled or something. It's prepared. There's a state for the two particles. Notice here, we don't, we don't have to think about this as being quantum mechanical systems. They could obey some weird statistics. The important thing is that they are, they, they are modeled by a causal process theory. So they both receive a system like this. Bob's receive is, and then he prepares the system in, uh, in a state B. It does some transformations, and then he gets a state, and Alice gets a state. So the question is, can Alice learn about what Bob does over here, so this B, by even if she doesn't know what happens after, like without ever talking to Bob again? She just knows what the state that she receives is. And this is modeled by, by this diagram here, where Alice basically is discarding Bob's system, and she's just looking at her side of the system. And so the question, this, is, this diagram represents the state that Alice's particle will be at the end of this evolution. And, um, and so now we can apply our, our axioms of the causal process theory. So the first thing here is that we, have, we are discarding after applying a transformation. So this is the same as discarding before applying transformation. So this T prime is deleted. Then this is like, this is a discarding of two systems, but this is like discarding each system separately. And then since this is a causal process theory, this is just the number one. So it's the, it's a, it's, it's the unique scalar. And what we're left at the end of the process is this. And if you see Alice's state does not depend on anything that Bob did. It doesn't depend on T prime and on B. And this is exactly what it means to be non signaling. So if Alice knows the full evolution, maybe she doesn't know B or T prime, but she, and she doesn't know anything about what happens to the system of Bob after, so there's no further communication from Bob, then Alice doesn't know anything of what happened to Bob, even if they shared the particle, uh, they shared the system that maybe was entangled at the beginning. And uh, so this is the result. This is, for example, the result that you cannot signal even if you share a quantum entangled particles. Um, sorry, one second. My computer is not charging. Excuse me. Okay, now it's charging. So now let's specialize even more. And here actually we are we are adding some some structure to the elements of the theory. So um, as the name as the name suggests, generalized probabilistic theories, also known as GPTs, uh, they are designed to deal with probabilistic predictions of uh, of your experiments. In particular, in, in a GPT, there is always some system that is a classical system that represents the classical probability distributions that you get at the end. And um, in fact, of all the process theories, the GPTs are the ones that are used most um, most often in quantum foundations. For example, it was use, it was using GPTs that it was demonstrated that there can be stronger correlations than quantum entanglement that do not allow signaling. So, um, and also some some reconstructions of quantum mechanics using uh, information theoretic principles were derived within the GPTs. The main the main point of the GPT is the difference from the any other process theory is that the processes belong to convex spaces. And the idea here is that if you're in a lab and you're doing something, if you can do one thing or you can do another thing, then you can do a third thing, which is flipping a coin and deciding what to do based on that, on the result of the, the coin flip. So for example, say you can prepare a state, then you can also decide to flip a coin and decide which ones to prepare. So if you have two state phi and psi, then you have, then in the theory there needs to be a third state which is a convex combination between these two. So it's P times phi plus one minus P, one minus P times C, where P is a probability. And this exactly represents some classical uncertainty on what you're gonna do. And uh, also these has to, transformations have to distribute over these um, stochastic space, over, over, over these uh, stochastic superpositions, stochastic mixtures, sorry. And the same way you can also, if you can do two processes, then you can flip a coin and choose which process to do. So this is the main difference. 
And notice now we have a notion of, we can have a notion of summing two events to represent, so summing two states or two processes to represent a statistical mixture. And uh, so if you want to model a classical system in a GPT, so you have a configuration space, right? So this will be like the positions that the thing can be at. The states are probability distributions over this uh, configuration space. And processes are stochastic maps that take, take probability distributions and output other probability distributions. And this can be about different systems. And then the discarding is the same as marginalizing the probability distribution over, over, the, over the relevant subspace. Here there's a mistake, this should be a y. But yeah, you're, you know, you're marginalizing probability distributions. So behind, uh, as a reminder, in case this was not clear, behind every diagram, there, is, there are formulas behind, obviously, but you don't, need, you don't always need to write down the formulas. But you need to be able to do it if you, if somebody asks you, you need to be able to write down what the formula is. So this is the, the, the recipe. An example of, of a classical system that you might consider is a classical bit, obviously. So a system that can be either zero or one, only has two states. And um, so the two states can be represented by, by two vectors, for example. And uh, these are the, this is the pure state of preparing the system in the state zero. This is the pure state of preparing the system in, in, in uh, state one. And the state space is just a line. It's a convex set always, and it's just a line in this case. Probability distributions obviously would be like this. Then you have the effects. The effects, if you remember, if you match a state with an effect, you need to get a number. So if you're representing states by vectors, you're representing effects by dual vectors. So from columns to back to, to rows, for example. And a thing like this, so a diagram like this represents the probability of observing one given a certain probability distribution. Then you translate this into some into your mathematical representations and you get out the, your number, right? This is a very simple example. You can do it also for, for quantum systems. In this case, you use density operators. So the states are density operators. The processes are these CPTP maps. These are the general transformations for density operators. And discarding is taking the partial trace over the, the subsystem. And notice that in fact, the correct GPT to use in quantum mechanics is the one is not the one with the, the Hilbert spaces. So the states are not the pure states. They're not vectors in the Hilbert space, but really they are the, the density matrices. And the reason this is the case is that you cannot, if you take two normalized states in the Hilbert space and you take a convex combination of it, this is not a normalized state anymore, right? So because what uh, the, the, the pure state Hilbert space way of representing quantum processes is dealing is working at the level of amplitudes, whereas GPTs really work at the level of probabilities. And so that's why you're working with mixed states. So in the density matrices and so on. So the state space of a qubit is the block sphere, not the block sphere, but the block ball. So you have all the pure states on the surface, but as you form convex combinations of these, you also move inside the ball. So the whole interior of the ball is, is there. And this is generally, this is what I said at the beginning of this uh, section that GPTs, you have this convex state spaces, like the sphere is not a convex space, the ball, is because you do these convex combinations. And these classical stuff, like you represent the pure state uh, spin up this way, spin down this way. And the general state is written like this. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you can, any point in the sphere. So if a point is, um, if you give it a Cartesian coordinate R, then this represent, corresponds to this state where you take the dot product with R with the, with the poly spin matrices to write down the, um, the density matrix. It's kind of a cute, cute exercise to do if you've never seen it. So we talked about general, general probabilistic theories. Now we can finally get really close to the, to the theorem. And uh, we need to define what classical and entanglement mean. So classicality has a very neat representation in GPTs, which is just that if you have the identity of a classical system, I've been representing classical systems with the uh, gray wires. 
then you can write it, you can write the identity as a different process that is the sum of projecting on, um, on, a, on a specific state in the configuration space and then preparing that state again, right? So this is, is a resolution of identity, if you want. And this thing really encodes the fact that classical systems cannot, don't have interference effects. So if you look at a transition probability like this, so you prepare some state S and you ask what is the probability of observing um, some other state E, some effect, something like this, then you can insert this resolution of the identity. And then what you get here is that you, you get the factorization of probabilities just like the classical, the classical uh, factorization of probabilities. So the probability of observing E given S is the same as the probability of observing E given that the system was in X times the probability that the system was in X given that it was prepared in S. And this is exactly the formula that does not hold, for example, in the classic uh, double slit experiment for quantum particles, right? The probability of reaching the, a point on the screen is not the same as the probability of reaching the point given that it was passed through one slit plus the probability that it reached this point passing through the other slit, right? So this is one of the how like this is one of the hallmarks of classicality. Like if a system does not obey this, then it's not a classical system. This is the definition. Classical, so this is basically the only definition, the only thing that distinguishes classical systems from, uh, from all the other systems, if you want, in, uh, <coughs> in GPTs. And um, you can use classical systems to, inter to interface with all the other systems that could be quantum or non-quantum as well. So for example, you represent a destructive measurement like this. So you have some system coming in, something happens to it, and then another a classical system comes out. Or you can have non-destructive measurement represented this way, where, where you, you have some leftover non-classical system. And for example, if you have a diagram like this, you have input a state, they undergo some transformation and you're discarding whatever is left, then this diagram, you write it down, you multiply all your little things together, and this is a probability distribution over the state space of X, right? So these are the predictions, if you want. So this is how you get your predictions from the theory. You make these diagrams and then you translate these into a number and uh, it gives you the probability distribution of the result of the measurement. You can also represent like classical communication. So like uh, conditional operations. So for example, here, some measurements goes on. It has a classical output. This output is fed into the control over some other transformation. And thanks to the to this factorization of the identity, you can also write it this way, where you see like you have some outcome and then you condition on the outcome, you make a new transformation here and you sum over all the possibilities. This diagram contains the probability of seeing X as well. So if you, if you look at uh, the last piece of the diagram on the right and you would discard B, you can get the probability of observing X, for example. Okay, so that was classicality. Now we can talk about entanglement. And in words, it's exactly the same as quantum mechanics. So an entangled state is a non-separable state. And a separable state is a state that you can write as a mixture of a correlated state. So a mixture of product states. So for example, if one of the probabilities is one, this is just reduces to the, to the definition we saw earlier. So like a state is separable if it can be written down as a product state. But here you also allow a mixture of such states because you can, because you can add them together. And what, what we can show is one of the cool results of quantum information theory is that local operations and classical communications cannot create entanglement. And this, what local operations mean, means that if you have, uh, if you have these non-classical systems sitting in two different labs, then the, um, all you can do in the labs is either apply transformations to the um, to your system separately, or a maximum you can do something and send a classical system over to the other lab. So this is a kind of diagram that represents local operations and classical communications. And we can show that this doesn't create entanglement, and it's pretty easy. So we start with a non-entangled state here, then we introduce this famous resolution of the identity in here. Then we can write down this. We can rewrite some boxes. So this, for example, this is 
m sub x, and this is c sub x, right? So this is a sum over severable processes. And um, what I tried to say earlier is that you can you can also rewrite this as properly normalized states where px is just uh, one over taking the trace of this box here that I'm circling, All right? So you take the norm of this and then you multiply it by one over that and you get the normalized state. And so what you get is that if you start with separable state, you end up at maximum with a stochastic mixture of separable states. And this is not an entangled state by definition. And this result, ah, sorry, this is, a, this is the definition of P of X. Um, this is a result that was known in quantum theory. That is, it is very well known in quantum theory, in quantum information theory. But since you, we proved it in a GPT, this is true for things, not just MB do not need to be classical. Yeah, sorry, they don't need to be quantum systems. They can be some post-quantum systems as well that we don't know. But it's still true, it will still be true that if you exchange only classical systems, then you cannot create entanglement. So finally, we can prove the Nogo theorem. And uh, the way to do it is that we will go to every, uh, every one of the assumptions and model it in the GPT. So basically, we said that there are three conditions. So there is no signaling between A and B. A and B interact locally via the mediator, G. And G is the classical system. So if these three things, we want to need to show is that if these three things are true, then you cannot create entanglement. So let's look at these conditions one by one. So no signaling between A and B. This is a precondition to be able to model A and B in a GPT, right? But we said like causal GPTs uh, don't have any signaling between separate systems. So you have to be able at least to treat them as different systems in a GPT to not have to not have signaling. So sorry, you, you need not to have signaling so that you're able to treat them as different systems in a GPT. So what our first condition tells us is that A and B can be modeled by a GPT. So now we are inside that class of theories. Then A and B interact indirectly via mediator G. So what is telling this is that G also is a, is a system in the GPT and the interactions are what is indirectly, so interact, interact, interact indirectly via G means that the interaction looks something like this, right? So any box where the systems go through don't include both A and B together inside. So this is the indirectness of it and also ensures no signaling. And interacting via G means that G goes inside these boxes. Right. Then the third condition is that G is a classical system, which means that we can use that resolution of the identity that we already used. And now the proof of the theorem is very similar to the one from the, the creation of the you show that you cannot create entanglement because now that we are in the theorem, now that we are in these GPTs, we can look at the first step of this evolution, the first two steps of this evolution. So a, G, and B are all starting unentangled. This is one of the assumptions. Then we look at the first rounds so where, where um, A and G interact, and then G goes on and interacts with B. And then we introduce our resolution of the identity. We deform the diagram this way, and then we can write these as se uh, two separate states. On top of it, we can look at this further state with G and B. We can insert the identity again in there. And so we get also that G and B are also separable. And so what we get at the end of this, uh, these interactions is that you get a statistical mixture again of product states. And so this is just, if the conditions of the theorem are held, then this is just repeated over and over and over again. And if you started with the separable state, then you still will have a mixture of separable states at the end. So this is the, the proof of the theorem. So there are probably some holes in the argument. Uh, you can go over and see the, the paper to see like more technically where the things are. But this is kind of the overview of the proof. And so let's look at what this implies if, if uh, for the different kind of models 
of the of the interactions sorry of the experiment that we looked at earlier so in linearized quantum gravity g so there is the creation of entanglement and this implies that g is quantum because it is no it's a uh, it is local for example so in linear quantum gravity there is entanglement and g is quantum with the newtonian interaction g is not a physical system right so there is creation of entanglement so one of the three uh, one of the three assumptions has to fail, and what fails is the fact that G is not a physical system. In the Schrodinger-Newton thing, where the, gravitation, where, the, where the gravitational potential is given by the expectation value of the position of the masses, A and B are signaling, there are like nonlinearities. And in fact, I even think that Schrodinger-Newton, because it has these problems with the conservation of probabilities, Schrodinger-Newton is not even a, a GPT, so it's inconsistent. Then there are spontaneous collapse models that don't have entanglement. And so depending on the model, your system can be quantum or non-quantum. It doesn't really constrain them. But as long as if you don't have entanglement, then your three assumptions can be true all the same time, which is the case, for example, in post-quantum post classical gravity, where you have a local classical field mediating the interaction, but in fact, it doesn't create an entanglement. And any theory that you go through, you can look at the, you can look, does it predict entanglement or not? And if it predicts it, then you, you, can, you can check that one of the three things failed. Finally, there is another proof, as I said, um, that goes more or less, like it more or less uses the same assumptions. Non-classicality in the proof that we just saw is relies on the concept of no interference. Whereas here, non-classicality is defined in terms of non-commuting observables. And uh, the framework is the constructor theory of information, which is a, I think, a much more recent framework. But the idea, again, it's like a general theory of information that is kind of physics independent or like physics agnostic. It describes the kind of transformations that can happen. And you can formulate different theories of physics inside of it. It's a less developed field, but uh, it's another proof I think you should, I would have pointed out. And so, yeah, so we went over this. Uh, families of theories and the specifics of the proof and uh, these are some of the references for both parts of the talk here are some well the image credits and uh, that's it so thanks for your attentions and um, and i'll take any questions now if there are any thank you very much andrea <clears throat> so if you have any question Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question or post it in chat. There's one in chat. Do you want me to read it or do you have the chat room? I can read it. So is the non-separability in quantum mechanics a manifestation of non-classicality statement in GPT? Um, yes, I think. So non so um, so classical systems basically in GPTs classical systems cannot get entangled with uh, with other systems. So if you want, in a way, um, yes, non separability is also manifestation of non classicality. And as I said, also non quantum state non quantum theories sorry non quantum systems can also be entangled. Just classical systems can't be entangled. according to that definition of classical theorem systems where you have this uh, resolution of the identity. Other questions? I guess it's been a long week, and I'm sure this is kind of a, a big change uh, of gear compared to what the stuff you were studying until now. Yeah, I, I really think so. Let's see that a little bit late. So if there are no other questions, let me just stop the recording.